Well, thanks for the, the invitation. So um, I, I probably won't be contradicting anything you've heard, but what I'd, and in some ways I, I, I wish I could have talked yesterday morning, only because I want to sort of start this presentation by giving a bit of an overview of what, what is design in engineering, which we all know, tie that to what SHM requires, talk about how people are doing it now, and then why the way that this action, this cost action is proposing is very synergistic with what makes the most sense. So we're going to conclude. Then I'm going to give some examples of where, where we've done simple design of SHM using some of these principles, okay? So hopefully, and you stop me anytime if you have a question uh, or a comment, not sure of something. I promise to go through the mathematics parts of the slides as fast as possible. Uh, so hopefully everybody's caffeinated. Okay, so everybody's probably had a design course or five <laughs> in your undergraduate, okay? So I, I took a formal definition of the word design, just in general. Doesn't mean about SHM, it could be anything, okay? It's the specification of something manifested by an agent intended to accomplish goals using a set of components satisfying requirements subject to constraints. Don't a lot of those words show up a lot in our discussion the last two or three days, couple days? Already, you start to see the, the, the relationship. So it defines specifications, plans, parameters, costs, actions. I'm not making this up. This is from a, the official source, okay? Processes and how what we do within legal, political, social, environmental, safety, and economic constraints in achieving those goals. Here's the, the, route, the reference, okay? So that's what design is. Now, I believe uh, Sebastian defined uh, SHM yesterday, and I'm going to get there with a, a redefinition in this context. But there are basically two ways people have done design in history. I mean, you can argue that this is too simplistic, but the first method is known as the rational model. It's basically an optimization problem involving, involving known constraints and objectives, lots of plans. It's understood in terms of discrete steps maybe interdependence, based on a very reasoned-based rationalist philosophy with technical rationality at its core. I think as engineers, this is what we're most familiar with. And this is a quote to sort of describe it. Design is informed by rational thought, research, and knowledge in a controlled manner. That's how especially the civil and mechanical engineers in the room have always done design, mostly. Then came software engineering. <laughs> And that changed everything. This is a big part of how software engineering in general is done today. It's much more creative and emotional, if you can imagine, to create design candidates. It's improvised. Nothing or very little is planned other than some very loosely defined objectives. Analysis, design, and execution are completely contemporary and linked, not conditional. And objectives, constraints, and requirements aren't definable is because they're always evolving, and I should have underlined this word, have lots of uncertainty. Another word you've heard a lot of in the last two days. So that's, that's how design competing philosophies are. So now let me define SHM and see what should motivate us. This is very consistent with, with Sebastian's de definition yesterday. It's the process of developing an in situ, meaning we're not going to take the component out of service, like traditional non-destructive testing, although many of the techniques that all of us are working on overlap tremendously with structural health monitoring and NDT, very related technology groups. In, in situ damage assessment capability for any component or system. Damage is defined as changes to the material or geometric properties of that system that affect performance. I, I, I make this a bold word because I think we're all engineers in this room. Any material scientists? I didn't pay attention yesterday. A material scientist would argue with this, right? 
material scientist has a very different understanding of what damage is. But we, as engineers, we care about performance. It's all about what are the goals of how the structure system is going to define, uh, uh, is going to perform. Now, I separate out SHM from something called damage prognosis. And that's a big part of what we're doing in here too. That's the process of combining assessments from SHM with predictive loading and failure modes to make performance level risk informed decisions regarding future actions. Well, again, you're starting to see the same kind of synergy. This is motivating why, uh, why we're doing what we're doing. So what does SHM require then if that's the definition? Well, all of those things. You've got to measure something. All of us have da uh, cannot do SHM without a measurement of something in situ. A key step for the last 30 years in SHM has been the second one. And what that means is essentially taking that data and turning it into features that you're going to use that lead to what I think the, the, the Sebastian and Jochen and, and uh, Daniel called indicators or metrics, something like that. And that process right there, this one bullet in my presentation is 30 years of research. Okay, some of you working in vibration, a feature might be a mode shape. If you're an ultrasonics expert, I'm, that's my area of most expertise really is ultrasonics, it might be a time of arrival or a wave speed or something like that. Doesn't matter. And then finally, this is the big one that's much less recognized in SHM, a framework for decision making using that information from the feature <coughs> extraction. Okay. So you've got to direct decisions or actions, and I'm going to make fun of our field in a minute. Okay, and of course there are challenges. And so the question always becomes this, can we have a generalized design principle that accommodates all the things I just said? Well, both de design philosophies are needed, as it turns out. Mostly rational, but a couple of elements of action-centric design are actually important for SHM. I don't need to read all of these. I would claim that SHM, because it was started by engineers, began uh, actually action-centric in the early times because what we used to do in our field when I started was in this business in the 1990s. Every single person, if they wrote a proposal that said, hey, I want to put a thousand sensors on a bridge, that's the end of the proposal. That's all they would say. Oh, yes, here's lots of money. Go to put a thousand sensors on the bridge. No constraint, no definition. Just go see what you can see. That's how SHM started. Now, as we got going in this field 30 years later, we are evolving much more toward a balanced, rational approach in this design. Okay, I should have said not because engineers actually uh, I said that backwards. The people who started the modern paradigm of SHM actually have computer science background. They're machine learning experts with uh, structural engineers kind of looking over their shoulder. So what is that objective uh, unifying principle? Risk. It was defined earlier today, I think yesterday as well. I'm going to define it very simply. The unifying principle that should guide, in, in my opinion, SHM design is risk. And I'll explain what, what that objective function is later. It's the product of the probability of an event and the consequences of that event. More likely a series of events or a series of interdependencies. And, in, and then the amount of risk that you can tolerate is known as safety. And that's up to the customer, right? Here's some very risk, risky high school student standing in their dance for a tornado. Okay? They accommodate lots of risk. Going fishing, you know, that's risky, I suppose, different kind of risk. It's up to the customer, the user of the technology, whatever it is, beachgoers in St. Martin, whatever it is that you can accommodate as a risk profile. So if that's the case, why not 
keep doing what the entire field thinks it's been doing and hasn't been in my opinion for 30 years. In the USA, we have something called the medical field risk assessment. So when you go to the doctor, this is the, the, the series of questions they will ask. Or they will ask themselves, maybe not you, but they will ask. Have you ever noticed the field is structural health monitoring, health? Well, we should keep borrowing from the medical field to complete the transition to risk-based design. What can go wrong? What's the likelihood that it can go wrong? And what are the consequences and associated time, squales, time scales? What can be done? What are the trade-offs in terms of cost benefits? And what are the impacts of the current decisions on future decisions and options? Well, isn't that interesting? That's exactly what maybe 95% of what we've been talking about. So we should continue to borrow, okay? So medical questions can be turned easily into the kinds of engineering questions that we want to do for SHM design. They're the right questions. We want, I think, minimum risk, which is what I'm going to call optimal, design under uncertainty. Minimal risk. Now, what, what are the units of risk? <laughs> Does it have physical units? Well, what are the units of a probability? Any answer is acceptable, but all answers are probably wrong. <laughs> None. It has no units. Probability is a dimensionless quantity, right? It's an... What about units of consequences? Yeah. Well, good point. I agree with you, but I would say just talk to your insurance company. There is a price on your head. So it's money. Yeah. I would argue it always comes down to some economic money. You can always project consequences into a monetary unit. Almost always. So risk is a money function, ultimately can always be converted into whatever units you want of currency, but it's a money function, okay? So here's where what we're doing now in SHM. So if you believe that point that I just made, here's why we're missing out on, in, in the design world. So like I said, I'm the editor of the SHM journal, have been for two years, I've been on the board for 10 prior, so I've seen a lot of papers, a lot of papers. Every single paper goes like this. Section one, introduction. Section two, let's make a measurement of something. Section three, let's tr use a little bit of knowledge and lots of try this, try this, try this, try that, try this, try this, try this, try this, and then throw all that away that doesn't work because we don't want to publish the negative results. And then we go to something that kind of works and we call it a feature. We take the sum of the squares of that feature and we call it a damage index. Um, every single paper I see in SHM Journal looks something like this. Oop, sorry. I bet every paper has a graph that looks like this. Damage, in quotes, index. Everybody loves to show charts like this. Oh, look. The damage goes up. Wow, I've got, a, I've got a correlated feature. Of course, what they never tell you is you guys well know that the error bars on this thing are like this. So that is, and then of course, chapter five, future work. How many times have you seen that? They leave all the hard stuff to somebody else. Okay, guess what? I fail those papers. First of all, this kind of trial and error approach without thinking in a forward way about uncertainty modeling and so forth, it throws away valuable information. It generates highly volatile, noisy, non-generalizing features with which you're going to make your decisions. Right? There was a wonderful paper done in Europe. Uh, Bart Peters, I'm sure some of you maybe know him, led it 
on the Z24 bridge in, I believe that's in Switzerland, right? The Z24? The bridge? Austria, yes, thank you. I couldn't remember exactly. Where he showed in a long term study that they were using, uh, uh, for features, they were using, I believe, mode shapes and natural frequencies of, a, of this bridge. They would test it. They showed that the features, that those sets of features varied 25% over the course of one day. And because it was, they were able to do a destructive controlled test, they damaged the bridge to only half of its load capacity and the features changed 2%. Would you call that a good feature? Think about it. The damage to half the bridge's rated capacity, load capacity, changed what they're using for decision making 2 to 3%. But over the course of one day, due to boundary condition changes from the environment, 24% the same features changed. Turns out that taking just the sum of squares is rarely optimal. So I'm going to introduce some of you to a field that gets us to the optimal way to process data. And that without that decision-making framework that you're already learning about and working in, you can't evaluate performance in a meaningful way. Okay? So I would claim this is a better way to do it. I'm not going to go through every block. But this is the part where we're going to make a big change that's going to help in the design process. We still have to measure something use as much knowledge as we can to get features, but we need to have the, the uh, accurate feature statistics models to get those likelihoods. And I know I'm getting ahead of myself here. And then derive what's known as a detector. How many people in this room, and I'm going to be surprised if it's any, have taken a formal class in detection theory? I didn't think so. I don't think we have any electrical engineers in the room. I don't think. I'm not one either, but it, I took this class as a professor from a colleague, changed my life. I encourage all of you, sit in on a class in detection theory, Bayes or in classical detection theory. Because then you can, I, was, I will show you the optimal detector, which then helps you lead to uh, how to make that optimal decision boundary. You weigh that by decision costs and that suggests the action as we've been talking about. So how do we do that? If that's all the case, we have to start the process first by defining what to do. What did I say was the worst thing I hated about SHM in the 90s? It was all just put sensors out there, right? So instead, if we're going to do risk-based optimal design, we actually have to start defining what it is we want to do. Okay, these are the four questions that every design process should start off with. What are the things we're actually being designed to monitor? I guarantee you, monitoring for corrosion is not going to get you the same results with the same system as if you had to monitor for a fatigue crack. They're not the same thing. Okay, so you have to define what that is, and you have to have some definition, even if it's somewhat stochastic, of the limit states of that critical failure, of those critical failure modes. You also have to know what specific action and decision structure your SHM system's going to direct, right? Is it just going to be able to be a simple binary decision, stop operation and inspect, or continue operation? It could be that simple, could be more complicated. What are the costs, boy, you've been seeing this a lot, associated with the decision and actions? What's the cost of a bad decision? What's the cost of a good decision? Okay, all those things that, that were shown in the decision tree analyses. What's the cost of the system itself? That's all part of the framework that you saw. And what are the constraints present in the design space? I can't put a thousand sensors on an airplane. No one's gonna allow that from a weight penalty alone. Okay, and a maintenance issue. So what do we want? A little bit of math now, apologize, but this is, this is basically what uh, Daniel was talking about. Different notation, different idea. Very generally, once you identify the constraints and the target limit states, what you need is the probability of observing those states given that you measured features, right? 
That's what we want. We want the probability of observing whatever target state or states we want, given that we've measured features. This could be raw data, or it could be something more sophisticated, like the mode shapes or whatever, for some fixed design. That's all the possibilities that go into the design of the SHN system, where you might put sensors, what kind of sensors, how often do you query them, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? That's what you want. And the reason, part of the reason why we are all interested in a Bayesian framework is that's very hard to do. So we take advantage of Bayes' theorem because what it does allow us to do, what we want, can be converted into things we can actually estimate or, or model or you, and use prior knowledge when appropriate. Okay? So I don't need to go through the details here. This is, this is, you guys all know this now after two days. Because while this is what we want, we know it's basically equal to these things. What's the probability of observing features in a known state? That's a good model. Or if we have the fortune, which we rarely do, but in some cases, we have the fortune of actually observing failures, right? In some fields, this is possible, and you can use supervised learning to get this, times the prior information, and that'll get us to what we want. So this is, this is the, the fundamental Bayes physics, if you will, or mathematical mathematics behind what is going, why philosophically we're trying to do what we're trying to do. If that's the case, now I've got to bring in the consequences or the, law, the, the cost then of all of that probability. This is a, just a definition. I didn't make this up either. Okay? The expected cost for any given design okay, is just the evidence weighed by some cost function. Now some people define this in terms of a utility instead of, and this is exactly how it's being defined in, in your uh, uh, your uh, notes. They're really, they're very related. You can look at it very similarly, whether you get utility out of a decision or do you take a loss from a decision. They're sister sides of the same thing. So it's just some well-defined utility or a loss function. That depends on the customer. The customer tells us, or maybe the insurance company, right? tells us what the, consequ the, the cost, the consequence of a bad decision is. And then I can use Bayes' theorem to convert that into the things that we can model and or measure. Okay? So I just went from the general definition, employed Bayes' theorem, and I got to this. Okay? So this is a measure as a function of design of the cost associated with that design. It's a very general definition where I've made very few assumptions at this point. Missing one critical ingredient before I go any further. I'm still missing how do you get from data, that's the features, whatever you measured, into a decision. What's that link? Okay, and that is where I have to bring on detection theory. This is why you should take that class, okay? This is why you should take that class. This is where I made the link in my mind, and I think it's, it's, it's very interesting. Basically, detection theory is just a method to quantify the ability to discern between information-bearing patterns under inevitable noise, right? It's just a rigorous, probabilistic way to do this. It involves hypothesis testing, which we've all heard of, all right? Bayesian detection theory, which is just a form of one form of detection theory beyond the Neiman Pearson, which I'll differentiate from in a minute, basically says minimize the cost loss of decision errors. That's the fundamental design principle. That's what Bayesian detection theory tries to do. Minimize the cost or, or, the, uh, or the loss, whatever units those are in, of a decision error. All possible errors that you could make in the decision expressed probabilistically from that previous equation weighed by the loss function, whatever it is. So that, it's not easy to do, but it can be done. And if it's just a binary decision case, which in, let, let's, be, let's be honest about it, many, many real SHM applications involve binaries decisions as, 
uh, Daniel and Jochen showed us. It's a series of, it could be multiple composite, but it's a series of composite binary decisions. Do I stop to inspect at this point? Do I not, perhaps, or whatever, all right? And if you do the mathematics, you don't have to do it again. It's been done for us, and it all comes down to a likelihood ratio, a ratio of likelihood functions. The detector, the optimum detector that minimizes Bayes' risk or, or cost is a ratio of two likelihoods. The ratio of observing our data in state i divided by the likelihood of observing our, our data, I keep saying data, but I also mean features, in state j or any other, between any two states. And that threshold, remember Sebastian asked a good question earlier, what, how do you get the threshold? In Bayes' theory, it's self-defined by the prior information between the two states you're, def you're uh, determining weighed by the costs of those decisions. You see where the business case is coming into the engineering here. Because this is where you choose that magical threshold of where you're going to make the decision between a distribution of features that represent damage versus a distribution of features that don't. Okay? And it comes and cost comes in. Some owners, structural owners, have higher risk profiles. They can tweak all of these numbers. Let me interpret these numbers. This, by the way, this is a very simple, simplified version where I assume it's a constant cost. Doesn't have to be. It just makes the math more complicated. A constant cost of decision. In the binary case, C10 means what is the cost of saying it's damaged, one, when in fact it's not, zero. Someone give me an example of what that would be, say, in, um, with an aircraft. Cost of saying it's damaged when it's not. What might we do, and what's the cost associated with that? if we're talking about monitoring, say, an aircraft, an in-service commercial aircraft. Cost of saying it's damaged when it's not might involve re a replacement of, a, it's gonna be more than that though, that's part of it. You might put a, a, a you replace a component you didn't need to. Delayed flights. Delayed flights, you've lost a lot of money from taking the flight out of service. Inspection time. So there's a cost associated with that. C00 is saying it's not damaged when it is not damaged. That's just the cost of doing business, whatever it is, normal operation. Usually you can normalize by that and let it be one. C01 is saying it's not damaged when it is. That's your insurance company saying, well, that's 187 lives times however many million dollars per life. And then the cost of saying it's damaged when it in fact really is damaged, you still have to take it out of service, you still have to inspect, you still have to do maintenance, and so forth. That's a simplified version, plus any prior knowledge. And you can see where if you have no prior knowledge between the two states, I really don't know if I, if, if how often I've observed or should expect to observe a crit critical fatigue crack or not, these two would cancel out, wouldn't they? 50-50. That's the, what's called an uninformed prior. You could, they would cancel out, and it's all cost-driven. Your risk profile, where you choose that decision point for the likelihood ratio is cost-driven completely in Bayes, the Bayes formulation, Bayes risk formulation. Okay? Can I ask a sure. Not necessarily. It, that's gonna, it, it, it might be for a given application. It doesn't have to be. Right? I mean, the cost of taking something out of service when it isn't may not actually lead to replacement of the part because you may look, like, look at it quickly and say, oh, pff, the engine's fine. Right? That costs less than actually taking it out of service and replacing an entire engine or a fan blade or something. So they don't have to be the same. It depends on the application. So if you know that transformation function, known as the detector, that's why it's detection theory, from continuous features to discrete decisions, we can use the change of standard change of variables formula, nothing special about that, to go to global loss function now. 
a discrete global loss function among all the states. Basically, it's all the pieces. And then the final step would be to minimize that global cost over the design space. And there's a design principle. Now, this isn't easy, but it's a design principle that will get you the minimum cost defined by decision error ways, weighings of design. Okay? Now, I have an interesting question for somebody. Does the minimum risk design, do you think, is going to be necessarily the same as the design that will give you maximum probability of detection or classification? Yeah? You could probably guess from the way I'm asking the question what I think the answer is. No. They might. It's rare, but they might. They might. But it's not guaranteed at all. The maximum probability of detection is not necessarily, that's what's called Neiman Pearson classical detection theory, where you choose for a given false alarm constraint that you're willing to tolerate. That, that sets your gamma, your, your uh, decision feature boundary, and then you, you can maximize the POD, or probability of detection. That's what classical Neiman Pearson detection theory says. We're not doing that. We're minimizing decision cost error in this design principle. The pieces are all there. All those questions that have to be asked, I color-coded them where they appear in that equation. So you can study that on your own time. Okay? All of those questions get mapped to some of those variables in the design problem, I think. Okay? So this is the ugly workflow. This is the math where everybody's eyes glaze over and we go to sleep, but we don't have to. This is what I just showed you step by step, what the design workflow could be. Okay? Now I will say, this is an incredibly hard step right here, this last little step. And this, the last step of optimizing over the design space, as you'll see for even simple examples, can be challenging because it's a very discontinuous design space and so forth. Okay? So let me do an example. Very simple one. First I'll do a computational example, then I'll do a real one. So one of my PhD students and I worked on this a few years ago. So a simple example of design using this philosophy. Optimal sensor placement. I'm going to constrain the problem that we're going to assume that a wing structure undergoes bending and torsional loading and it's subject to impact on the leading edge. So it might hit debris, plus it has the usual bending and torsion fatigue. What's my allowable design space? I'm going to optimize the number and placement of sparse array ultrasonic transducers, piezo type transducers. So we're not going to use vibration here. It's going to be a different SHM technique. We're going to be constrained by the customer. Airbus said, no, you have to use ultrasonics because we're comfortable with it. OK, let's do it. And there's our problem. So we have, to, we have to start off by figuring out how do we get those likelihoods. Okay? So I'm going to take this wing and I'm going to consider a set of local damage modes defined by the location, orientation, and uh, type of the, of the damage. All right? Just locally. Could it happen here? Could it happen there? Remember what Daniel said. This is where the likelihood modeling is going to start. So let me define the problem very clearly and see where all the variables are in my problem. So prior knowledge, fatigue cracks at 0 and 45, so there's clearly state, the states I want. Usually it's, you have to be of a certain size, so many millimeters or whatever. Cracking is distributed over the structure but biased to the leading edge. That's prior knowledge. I expect there to be crack initiation perhaps on the leading edge due to impacts. I have to define my actions. This one's going to be simple binary, one step. Do we stop operation of the aircraft to inspect on the next cycle? Or no, let it keep going. Normal operation. What's the constrained design space? In this case, it's just number and location of piezos. I define the decision and action cost. Now, I make these numbers up, but that's OK for the purposes of illustration. The cost of inspecting an aircraft when there's no damage, $1 per square centimeter. It's much more than that, but OK. Not inspecting when there is damage, $1 million per square centimeter. 
So this would be called my false positive cost. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, well, depends how you define negative and positive here. This is basically, it's not damaged, but we're spending some dollars to have to inspect it because we think it is. This is the false negatives where it's damaged, but we thought it was fine. I'll say it's $2 per transducer. That's probably the most accurate of the three numbers. All right, and then I gotta form the likelihood functions. That's, a, that's challenging, so let me show you step by step what I did. You gotta define the problem though. You see, I went through all the steps here. I thought this was a brilliant cartoon that I found where it's a software engineer and a manager. And the manager keeps saying, well, so the software engineer says, what are we trying to accomplish? I'm trying to make you design my software. I mean, what are you trying to accomplish with the software? I don't know what I can accomplish until you tell me what the software does. Trying to get this concept through your thick head. The software can do whatever I design it to do. Can you tell me it, can you design it to actually tell me my requirements then? You know, this is the cycle that SHM has been in for a long time. Between the engineer and the customer, really the customer, the, the, the constraints and the problem have to be defined. So how am I going to build that likelihood function in this problem? Let me give you an example, very step by step. Now I'm going to use ultrasonics. So I apologize for anybody, to anybody in who has never done an ultrasonic sparse array test. It's, I'm going to show you the signal processing steps that you go through to get your likelihood function, but it may not be the same if you're doing strain monitoring or acceleration or mode shape, but the, but the ideas are the same. The math won't be, but the idea is exactly the same. So what we do in ultrasonics is we, we send out energy from all the, every sensor to every other sensor, right? We look for pulse echo or pitch catch arrival of ultrasonic waves at some specified frequency. Right, we have one, ex one piezo actuates, all the energy goes in one direction, all of the other sensors see that energy, and the idea is if there's a defect in the structure, it will scatter the ultrasonic energy, and we're gonna see that. So the first thing we have to do is kind of subtract off the background, because everything scatters ultrasonic energy. Then we're gonna do some bandpass filtering because we only put one tone in. We don't care about conversion, nonlinearity to other tones. And because it's impossible to estimate phase in a sparse array, you got, you, wavelengths are so uh, small compared to uh, the distances, we're gonna get rid of phase. So if this is what the received waveform looks like, we're only gonna look at the amplitude, the red curve. Now. If I subtract the background and I do it perfectly, so I do a test in a pristine condition, whatever that means, and then I do the test again, no damage, what should that red curve look like? Same exact test. Hmm? Zero. zero. I better get zero, because I'll get the exact same red curve again. The same pattern of reflections and bouncing off the boundaries, etc. If there's a defect, somewhere there's going to be a mismatch, isn't there, in the reflected and reference signals, and you'll see bumps. Now you'll always see some because, of course, like we've been hearing about, everything is uncertain. What if the temperature changed just a little bit between the two tests? What if your transducer did something? What if there's, there's other random processes that can creep into the system? Well. You can imagine that the red curve is not flat. It's full of noise. And we got to find the so-called needle in a haystack. Okay, we got to find that blip. That first blip that tells us there's a scatterer present in the wing. So what are, how did I get the detector? Here's the math. I made an assumption. You can always kill me based on assumptions, right? But we have to start with a model somewhere. So I assume that the uh, underlying waveform, that blue waveform, which is what I measure with my piezos, has Gaussian noise sitting on top of it, okay? Now, if you go through the process here, if you assume that that is, whoops, if that is Gaussian, that's my blue curve, and I go through all of these steps through the second one, it's still Gaussian. I won't go through the reasons why. 
but subtracting a background, subtraction of two Gaussians is still Gaussian, filtering keeps it Gaussian, that doesn't, linear filtering doesn't change the process. Something funky happens when I take the envelope though. Okay, envelopes can only be positive, so it's no longer Gaussian there, so I have to model that. I'm also going to assume that each data point is independent. And if I model that, if I actually do the mathematics to see how does Gaussian data transform to my feature space, it turns out it's Ricean. It's like, like a Rayleigh signal with a bias. It's a, it's a standard probability density function form. So I have my hypothesis test between undamaged and damaged now. What should my feature look like? It should be Ray, uh, Ricean noise with zero mean if there's no signal, and it should be Ricean noise with an unknown amplitude and unknown phase or variance if there is a signal. Because I don't know necessarily what, size of, what the size of the signal is, right? I just know there's a defect. Okay, so I have my feature statistics. If I have my feature statistics though, I can plug into that detector formula and look what pops out. I never in a million years would have guessed this is what I should do with my data, but I should sum over all the data, take the log of the Bessel function of the data times the, times the amplitude of my data divided by the variance of the noise level. Who knew? <laughs> but that's what detection theory would do. Rigorous detection theory gets me to what, this is what's called, some of you may have heard this term, this is known as a matched filter. Okay, it's a matched filter. We're essentially taking our data, we're weighing it against the ratio of what we expect the data to be, divided by the variance, and we take the Bessel log of it, sum up over all the data. So how do I get the expected scatter amplitude and noise? Either prior experiments, that's unusual, or a model. I used a very simple model, and I'm going to show you, I think in here, finite elements weren't even needed. You just got to capture the relevant physics and it turns out that in ultrasonics phased array, you just need beam spreading. One over the square root of the distance, the amplitude of that wave should go down from a scatterer at one over the square root times some factor that depends on the shape of the scatter that you've defined and it's called a scatter matrix. It's all calculable. Okay, it's all calculable. So essentially we discretized that wing into little pieces and looked at every possible path. And then I created, like Daniel showed us, an ROC. Okay? I looked at, once I had that de detection, uh, once I had that uh, uh, detector formed from the mathematics, I looked at different, how different models affected the detection performance. Okay, so another way you can use ROCs, in addition to the way Danielle was showing you earlier, is actually to compare detectors or, de or compare pieces of how you got the detector. Down here, this is my ROC, false alarm rate versus detection rate, when I just did something where I assumed I knew nothing about the scatterer. I just said that the scatter itself was a random variable of unknown amplitude and uniformly distributed. Okay, so no physics involved. And this is my ROC. I made a simple assumption of that beam scattering model and, a, and calculated for fatigue cracks at 0 and 45 what the scatter matrix is from a physics model and look how I improved my ROC just from a little bit of physics. ROC went all the way up to here. Then I did a finite element model. Thousands of minutes of calculation of watching waves propagate through the thickness and do this. No improvement in the, well, negligible improvement. So you can see, remember Daniel showed us that perfect performance in a, in a, in a an ROC would show perfect performance if your line was up here. Perfect detection independent of false alarms. You always get 100% detection. And what this is showing you is a way of comparing detectors. This one is a lot better than this one. It's closer to uh, the best. Okay. So once I had that, now I can do the global optimization problem. I have the detector. Let's figure out where to put the sensors. 
okay, how many to use and where to put. So now I'm going to do the minimization over the, all the possibilities of where to put sensors on that wing. My, I, I decided to use a design gene. I, I did evolutionary algorithms because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough problem where my gene for the possibilities is some location x, y on the wing plus whether I should use that transducer or not. Okay? Because if, if the algorithm says, oh, put the, put the sensor 20 meters away from the wing, well, that's pretty stupid. But it could do that, <laughs> right? So we did all that. And here's the results that pop out. Depending on sensor cost, this is the optimum arrangement that minimizes Bayes' risk, given all the costs that I put in. You can see that when sensors are cheap, the algorithm favors global coverage. When sensors get expensive, it tends to bias them to the leading edge a little bit in accordance with prior knowledge. Okay, So you can kind of put these things in terms of things that managers like to see. For the transducer cost, how many transducers equal uh, the, the minimum risk, what the cost was. You can flip that and look at what the total risk was as a function of transducer cost. And this can be used as design information. And in, and in fact, if you have a reasonable model of your design before you build it, you can do this before. If you don't believe me, let's do an experiment now. So. It's on a wing. It's a piece of metal with a bunch of sensors. Now, I asked a slightly different question because I didn't want to take sensors on, off, move around, blah, blah, blah. I just put a bunch of sensors on there and I said, choose the best four, eight, 16, 32. But that's a very similar problem I think you can appreciate as to the previous one. Okay, so we did the same thing, 192 potential damage locations, which I simulated by just putting this little piece of lead on the plate because that scatters ultrasonic energy pretty well. It's not real damage, it just, it's just a way of moving damage around. Okay, So I went and drank beer while my students stayed up all night <laughs> and did this experiment. Here's the results before any experiments were done on the left. The predicted optimal arrangement of all you can budget for sensors was this. After the 10,000 experiments that were done, that's the best four. By actually looking at all 10,000 possible arrangements. Brute force. Almost exactly the same. This is the, oops, this is the distribution of cost or risk associated with all 10,000 of, of the designs that were possible. And in both cases, we found the minimum one. And you can see as there get more and more sensors, it's not precise. But all that shows is the robustness of the approach. The minima don't have sharp, sharp peaks in this case. They're a little bit more soft, the minima, minimum cost. So there's robustness. That's probably a good thing from a design perspective. But at the end of the day, it's a design tool. So it could be used as a design tool. And again, this design was taken, that Bayesian experimental design minimum risk. We did it on other structures. Here's a bolted frame, a civil, more of a civil structure where damage was defined two ways. Quarter turns on a bolt and a magnet. We still used ultrasonics because it's what I'm the most familiar with. And here, for example, is the, or, the uh, you can turn the problem around instead of what's the optimum design. Rather, you can ask a similar question, which is what we did here. What's the order you should remove sensors to maintain a certain level of risk? or certain risk profile. And so the, the numbering are the sensors uh, that you should, you, the, uh, the order that you should remove sensors. This is the least important sensor in the, in the possibility. This is the most important. Okay, the blue were defined to be the minimum. The blue five sensors were, were, were sort of the minimum to achieve in parallel some nominal probability of detection because Sometimes if you just use Bayes risk, Bayes risk without checking what equivalent detection rate that gives you, you may, you may irritate your customer. Oh, the minimum risk solution gives you 5% probability of detection. That may not meet some critical criterion. Here's the optimal number of sensors as a function of uh, different cost ratios. Remember, you can put different costs on 
baking a bad missed, a false positive, a different cost on a different false negative. You can see the, 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 the ratios up there, and you can see that they're, depending on the damage that we're targeting, only the bolt loosening, only the magnet, or if you have to consider both failure modes in your likelihood function, what the minimum is. So here, there's no value being added by adding more sensors, okay? In this case, for this particular cost ratio. For example, in here it takes more sensors in these other cost ratio uh, risk profiles. Okay, that's just what the optimum arrangements were for those different four profiles. If you fix the number of sensors, you could so you could play around with this. However, whatever your constraints are, we basically the difference between this and the previous slide is we change the objective function slightly. Number of sensors or fixed sensors, minimum cost could be anything you want. So the last thing I'm going to say. I told you this wouldn't take an hour and a half. The last thing I'm going to say is how synergistic this design philosophy that everybody's talking about is with a very well-established field of control. We are basically equivalently solving a stochastic control problem. So I want to show you just a few quick slides on that. All right. What is control? Some of us have taken a controls class. We know, broadly speaking, it's the application of some form of feedback to a system in order to have the system behave in a way we want, right? Many strategies for doing it. Pole placement, you've probably heard of. Adaptive control, hierarchical control, stochastic control, optimal control, robust control, among many others, okay? There's a thousand strategies out there. But I honed in on optimal control. It's a strategy that seeks to minimize a more generalized cost index, a cost functional of all the state variables that must be minimized. It's very, very, very equivalent to what we're thinking about. There's an optimality criterion, a control law, that's what we're trying to achieve, and constraints, just like an SHM. It's originally attributed to Pontryagin and Bellman. And it's in fact, what well, the equation I'll show you in a moment is known as the Bellman optimality equation. And it, he did it to solve a rocket speed and fuel problem and some problems in economics from game theory. So simple example, driver on a fixed hilly road going from one place to another. Let's say we all have to go to the restaurant okay, by ourselves. How should the driver accelerate or decelerate? That's the control law. Fixed amount of fuel could be a constraint. There's no gas petrol station between here and the restaurant. Known path, that's a constraint, not too many roads from here to the restaurant. And the cost functionals could be whatever you want it to be. Minimum time, I've got to, get the, I've got to be the first one to get to the beer. Because I know students be all gone by the time I get there. Minimum fuel, if you've got to pay for fuel, that's important. Or minimum total expenditure, that would be like the Bayes risk more close to the total cost that we've been talking about today. So the Bellman optimality principle, an optimal policy has the property that whatever the initial state and initial decision are, the remaining decisions must constitute an optimal one with regard to the state starting with the first decision. Decision hierarchies, just like we're talking about in here. And so assuming discrete time and discrete control, this, we have a state equation that evolves our system, right? We may not know it perfectly, but we can model it or estimate it. And we have our decision constraints defined in terms of the state variables. Could be our features. Bellman's principle is expressed like this. Again, there's a utility, or equivalently, if you want to do the inverse, a loss function. It's normally in control done with a utility function, but again, there's a synergy there. Okay? Find the decision that minimizes the global utility function. Well, here's the first decision. We split out the first control decision, we get this. So here's the first decision, here's the subsequent decisions. The second term is just the loss. So we have this, okay? And then everything can be defined recursively. See how this is this, and then I have a, uh, every Further decision in some sense, or I should say loss, defined in terms of a, a previous one. And so the idea is to solve for W, which will then yield the optimal control decision. Okay? That's known as optimal control. And it can even deal with uncertainty. If the problem contains uncertain parameters, 
the thetas, noise, and, and all those can be included in the loss function. And all of a sudden, this is starting to look just like the Bayes risk equ equation, isn't it? Okay, that's another minimization problem. And look how equivalent they are. The top equation was the design principle we're proposing here that incorporates all the things we've been talking about. This is the Bellman optimality principle. Very, very similar. There's a lot of parallels between them in terms of, again, I'm color coding the parallels between optimal control and structural health monitoring. So I think there's a lot we can learn and are using from the control field. Although I would claim almost nobody is publishing in this, with this way of thinking. Almost nobody. So it's still new to SHM people, I think, to exploit a lot of the power of optimal control as a parallel to structural health monitoring. Okay? So some final comments. It's, what I like about Bayesian experimental design is it's a very rigorous, consistent method to execute a risk-based design for SHM because all the pieces are there that I think are needed. And it puts SHM design in the right sweet spot of trading performance, risk, and cost, right? I mean, if, if all clients, customers, had infinite capacity to pay us, there'd be no need for this. It would just be probability of detection or probability of classification. But there isn't. That's not the real world. And I've found recently that optimal control is a very synergistic field that integrates the same elements where the decision space is analogous to the design space. It's the same kind of policy question. Okay. So I use these, I hope you know, this, this lecture was kind of at a, a different perspective. But there's a lot of the same things in this, I would claim, that you're, that you're learning about and you're doing now. So I think I'll stop there and see if there's any comments or questions or anything. Has anybody seen ex Bayesian experimental design in a statistics class before? No? Bayesian stuff is not taught, you, you have, yeah, you don't count. <laughs> yeah. It's not taught very much, but I, I don't know. My opinion is that it's a, it's, it's a rigorous, powerful tool. That's sort of the underpinning behind a lot of what of, that Daniel taught. Any other comments or questions? It's a lot to absorb. <laughs> So I find it very interesting how you, you presented, and you said also in this way, a lot of this stuff is more or less the same stuff that we've been talking about, using different terms, coming from different yep. theories. Yep. At the end, you mentioned optimal control, and tomorrow I'm going to speak about sequential decision making and using this Markovian decision process. Yep. Optimal and this double equation comes there. But it's, it's, Excellent. It's basically the same thing. And Excellent. There have, been some, there have been some works that use these OMDP ideas for SHM optimization yeah. by some colleagues. Uh, yeah, there's a, there are some. It's just very well, little. Yeah, no, exactly. yeah. Exactly. yeah. Um, so it's, uh, it's, 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 it's sometimes challenging for me, it's sometimes challenging because you speak with people that if people are really smart, they understand it's the same thing. But sometimes people come in a certain background and they do essentially the same thing, but they have learned it. As you say, you know, they, they come from electrical engineering and they have single detection theory or they yep. come from optimal control. <coughs> they do the same thing, but they have different terminology. And if they are not very smart, they don't necessarily understand that actually it's, it's, it's the same thing we're talking about. Yep. You call it, I call it FITA, you call it, uh, you call it but it's like uh, so sometimes it's a bit challenging for students not to get confused also. Yeah. And uh, because I think it's also helpful to, to find your theory, that we, your approach, that we, I take an optimal control view, or I take the patient decision analysis view, and, and try also to, to, to stick to that, and, and really get deep into that, rather than trying 10 different theories and stay on the top of those theories, because the more the end is stronger to, 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 be, to be strong in one or two, to have really your 
feet on the ground is in one or two of those. Yeah, at the end of the day, you have to implement it. And you have to do it yourself. Yeah, you have to do it yourself. That's when you, learn, you, that's when you start realizing the situations yep. are really the same thing. Yep, yeah, that's exactly where I realized, and it, it was very interesting to watch, well, all of the lectures here, but yesterday, I said, yep, 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 <laughs> yep, yep, yep. You know, see the steps. You guys are doing very much some of this, or a lot of this. And um, it's coming, again, giving you a language and a toolbox to think about it, and maybe showing you a little more detail about how to directly tie it to SHM. So I hope that's what we accomplished a little bit. Yes, question. Mm -hmm. Not being a very um, reliable. Um, it's just not optimal. Not optimal parameter for feature yeah. extraction from data. Well, I'm asking this because I actually just have a paper already, and mm -hmm. I have a leak index, just as you said, and mm -hmm. the root mean square. Mm -hmm. So um, probably if I send you to SHM, you're not going to accept that. So <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting tough. No, let me show you something. Let me show you a, a one, one slide. Uh, whoops, that where we compared all the literature features to the optimal one just to show you exactly what I'm talking about. I didn't put it in this uh, presentation, but I think I can do it in another one that has some of the same information in it very quickly here. Okay. This is a, a lecture I, I give on the, the, the details of Bayesian experimental design. Let me find the right slide. Okay, let's see in this mess where it is. Um, uh, oh, maybe it was in the, no, it's under the detector chapter. See all that math I left out for your benefit? You can thank me later. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, maybe it's not it. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, we went on that frame that I showed you, the civil, the, the, the mechanical frame. What I did is I went to the literature for everybody who uses their index for bolted joint detection. And I did what, I, I, I took their algorithm and I duplicated it, replicated it myself. And then I derive for the bolt a detector, what I consider to be the optimal. Now, it's not the same optimal detector that I just showed you, okay? Because it's a problem where I assumed I knew nothing about the reflections. In that bolted joint, there is no way I can model ultrasonic energy through all those turns and impedance changes. It's just too hard. Simple, it's not a plate, it's too hard. So I said, okay, I will turn my expected amplitude into a random variable. I won't go into the details of how that changes things, but it does a little bit, same idea. And I derived an optimal detector that was very close to the sum of squares for that problem. It's called the energy detector. And that's the red, that's the ROC, it's the red. This is what everybody else in the literature gave for the same data set, the same problem. So you can see it's truly optimal. Now you can also see that the, the blue dash is very close. And what that is, that feature is, is essentially calculating energy at the, max, at, the, at the center band of the excitation. So that's where most of the energy is anyway. So if it weren't very close, I mean, it's statistically equivalent. It's the same thing. We actually calculated the full energy from the waveform. They just calculated energy in a narrow frequency band, and they got almost the same thing. So my point in doing that is showing you there is an optimum Again, the energy detector for the rib, which was a BAE-146 fuselage frame where we had to find blind, blind test rivet holes, also optimal. And the ones that are very close to it turn out to be essentially just a different way of calculating energy. Okay, so they have the same statistical performance. They have the, and that's all that matters. And I think that point was made by, our, by, by the, the lecturers. Let's say you, let, let, let's say I ask every 20 of you to come up with what you think the best feature is. 
Okay, so you're going to try your vibration method. I'm going to try my ultrasonic. You're going to measure strain. I don't know. You're going to measure temperature. <laughs> Crazy man. You're, you're going to dip it in water and dance. I don't know. Whatever you want to do for your inspection. And we're all going to create an ROC. Okay, the only thing that matters is not how many steps or how much processing you did, but the statistical model of that feature. What are the likelihoods? That's all that matters. And what, what I found in a lot of studies in the, in the literature is that people are reinventing damage indices metrics that have exactly the same statistical performance as stuff that was done 25 years ago. It's not really new, is it? Maybe a new feature. Oh, look, the Mike Todd feature. This is the coolest thing ever. But it has the same statistical performance that some strain energy guy in 1977 wrote about. That's all that matters is the statistical performance down the road. So I'll make a, a, a final point about that. If all of you want research projects someday, how do you, how do you actually process data from raw data to the feature so that it has that you can show that it has that right statistical performance, optimum statistical performance, some kind of differentiator between those two distributions, maximum likelihood, right? What are the signal processing steps I should do on an acceleration time history to do that, okay? That's kind of what optimal detection theory is getting at, but it doesn't say what to do to go from an acceleration to a, another feature. You just have to do it by brute force. Can you actually solve the inverse problem? I don't know. Maybe machine learning will help. I don't know. But anyway, anything else? OK. Good. Well, we'll see you guys at the bar. <laughs>